In this video, Neville Goddard will talk about a really fascinating subject that we all often think about. We will discuss about how manifestation works making it our own reality. When you read and study Neville Goddard's work, please remember he was never trying to teach you to change your physical reality. He was instructing you on how to change your viewpoint. There was something I read about a year ago, and it really altered the way I thought about manifestation which helped me a lot. Your identity is more influenced by what you do than by the circumstances of your life. Stop picturing that right now, and it won't be inside of you anymore. Then start telling yourself that you already own all the resources you need or want. Don't allow other people's limited viewpoints define you, you are not defined by them. You are a miracle at birth and the most significant person in the universe that you can imagine. Therefore, you now have the choice of either letting your imagination go wild and visualizing how great and wonderful you truly are, or you can keep allowing those little remarks from both yourself and others to diminish your worth and make you feel less valuable than you actually are. Neville Goddard suggests that we test the law of assumption since the fundamental tenet is that God is your imagination. Neville challenges us to put the power to the test. The majority of us were never taught how to utilize our senses to communicate with the universe using an innate universal code that we all share, or how to learn about our emotions. Because you believe it, the universe behaves how you feel it should. The universe loves you so deeply that it reflects the thoughts, beliefs, and experiences you have within, and it gives you precisely what you want. Now let's hear Neville in his own words. But before moving on, make sure to subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon, if you like our daily content. Make sure to listen carefully, enjoy. Now we can say the same thing over and over. And finally, at one little moment, people grasp it, they understand it. So I can tell you night after night, that all things exist in the human imagination. And I can tell you that man is all imagination and God is man and exist in us and we in him. That the eternal body of man is the imagination and that is God himself. That is the divine body we call Jesus Christ in scripture. And because of previous training, we may question that or hesitate to, well, take it seriously. Tonight I hope I can show you through stories how true this is. You may never really lose yourself to the extent that I wish you would, but nevertheless, I'll tell you. Last Saturday, a friend of mine in from New York, she came in during the week and she was here on Friday. And I invited her to dinner on Saturday with a few other friends of hers out here. She called during the day and asked if she could come early. Could she come at four instead of five when I invited them? That she had things to tell me and they would not understand it and she would feel ill at ease in the presence of others in discussing these things. Now let me go back a little while with this lady. I met her here in this city 20 odd years ago. She was a beautiful young woman, about 30, a model. She had bought a little home for her parents and she was paying off the mortgage. And she said to me then, this is now 20 odd years ago, I've always dreamed of going to Paris and I really don't have the money. I have enough in the bank to go tourist and live for just one week in a modest way. Go to some small little hotel or maybe some little rooming place and only for a week, I couldn't afford beyond that. And even that seems stupid now, when I think that I'm still paying off on the house. I said, you're asking the wrong person for advice, because 
I am not a rational person when it comes to the world. To me, I do not go along with the reasoning mind. I am talking of an entirely different principle. I am speaking of imagination, and imagination to me is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ to me is God. And there is nothing but God, and all things are possible to God. If you want me to give you a reason for going or not going, do not ask me. You want to go, and you have just enough for a quick one. One week in Paris, maximum, go tourist and live modestly and come back? Well, she didn't tell me what she would do, but she did go. On the second day in Paris, on a blind date, she met a man, 23 years her senior. He was already married five times. There was no offspring, but they fell in love. He divorced his fifth, married her, and they were blessed with a child, the image of that man. When I saw pictures of him, he was born in Russia, when I saw pictures of him, it could have been pictures of his little boy. Through the years, well, the man is very wealthy. He came into a fortune. International business. Factories here in our country, factories in Paris, factories in Puerto Rico, and factories all over. A very, very wealthy man. <clears throat> he went wild over this offspring. Well, as a boy grew, he was then two and a half years old, and one night I had a vision, and I saw a little boy, he was about five years old, handsome beyond measure, and he told me that I was his father. I said, well, if I'm your father, then when are you going to come on earth and be my son? So I am your father. Are you coming down to earth and be my son? He said, yes. I said, when? He said, on the 10th of November. I said, you are? Now, this is late September. So I said to my wife the next morning, I said, darling, you know, you're going to have a baby on the 10th of November. <clears throat> and she said, I really believe all that you teach, but after all, this is ridiculous. I'm not even pregnant. This is late September. I'm going to have a son on the 10th of November. <clears throat> she said, no, that is out. I said, all right, that's what he told me anyway. That night in New York City at my lecture, this lady appeared. Her little boy was two and a half, and she was way out in hell. She looked as though she could have it right then. So I said to her, when do you expect your son? She said, no son. I am going to have a daughter. <clears throat> Joseph and I, we want a daughter. Don't want any son. We have our son. I said, but when do you expect your child then? She said, oh, the doctor said around early January. I said, should your son be born on the 10th of November, May I tell you his name? <clears throat> his name is Neville Mark, <clears throat> because that's what he told me. <clears throat> well, on the 10th of November, she had her little boy, and she called him Neville Mark. <clears throat> well, the family now of four, the two boys, and they grew. <clears throat> when the first one, the image of his father, Larry, reached the age of 18, they sent him off to college in England. <coughs> Pardon me. And one morning, on a Saturday morning, I got a call from her, and she said, Larry is dead. Didn't prepare me at all. Said, Larry is dead. I said, what are you talking about? She said, I've just got a call from the headmaster of the college in London. Larry was killed today. Suddenly, in this automobile accident, one of five, but he was the only one killed. The other survived. He wasn't driving the car, he was in the car. And we are leaving within an hour. Joseph and Neville and myself, we're leaving in the hour to go to London. So they did, <clears throat> and brought back the ashes of Larry and scattered it in Central Park. She went into shock. 
completely shocked. And for two months, she wasn't here. Her husband called me long distance. He wrote me to what to do. I do not know what to do. Should I put her into some asylum? Should I bring in something because she is not here? <clears throat> she refuses to be part of this world. But you do not know this woman. She has a determination that is like steel. You can't divert her. She can take any goal in this world and realize it. <clears throat> and she had one goal now. She had to know about Larry. If what I'm teaching is true, <clears throat> that all things exist in the human imagination, then Larry existed in her imagination. <clears throat> and she had <clears throat> to see him and touch him and know him. And know that he survived. She said, my religion failed me. My philosophies failed me. I couldn't open a book. Nothing could in any way encourage me or support me. <clears throat> and I lived in this state just completely in shock to the despair of my family. And on this morning, two months later, I felt something surging within me, surging and surging. And then out of my own being, here comes Larry. He is seated on the side of this chair in my bedroom. It's my bedroom. He lived on the 33rd floor on Central Park South. Here is Larry. And then I said, Larry, there? Well, I can put myself there too. And she did. I sat right next to him and felt him. Then I brought Neville. And he sat next to me. And here the three of us, I've never seen Larry so beautiful. His face was just like velvet. You've never seen such beauty of skin as Larry. And we communicated without the use of words. And he said to me, Mother, I didn't want to hurt you. And here he's talking to me without any use of words, but he's telling me, and I'm listening. Then I said to Neville, Never go and get Daddy. Daddy was then in the living room. This is the early hours of the morning, about six. Go and get Daddy and tell Daddy to come. And the minute he got up and started towards the living room to bring his father, something happened in her and something broke. And then the whole thing faded. But she said, at that moment, I was completely cured. I had a pain that no doctor could help. No philosopher could help. No religious person could help. No book could help. Here I am in a pain. A pain that no one could understand. It was a physical pain. My body was racked with it. And at that moment, I was completely relieved of all sense of loss and all sense of pain. And I proved that all things do exist in my own wonderful human imagination. And that's where Larry was.